Project engineer Nate Sexton returns to the podcast today, but this time as a guest. He's joined by lead technician Tyler Gendron. Nate and Tyler started their careers as co-ops at SME, and after trying their hands at a few different services, they each decided the Building Materials Group was the best fit for them. Welcome to SME's Build and Revitalize podcast. I'm Eric Morell, your host for this session. Today I have with me Nate Sexton and Tyler Gendron from the Building Materials Group. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Good afternoon, Eric. Uh, I'm Nate Sexton. I'm a project engineer in our structural materials group here at SME. Uh, we do a whole lot of rehabilitation design. Uh, I am an assistant project manager as well. We are consultants here on this team and we uh, work on a whole host of uh, historical projects. We bring a whole lot of old structures back to current code um, and current aesthetic standards as well. Good afternoon, Eric. I am Tyler Gendron. I am also part of the materials group where we do a bunch of rehab and assessment work. Currently, I'm doing a lot of concrete technology stuff, a lot of different fun stuff with concrete mixes and proportions. And I've worked in a couple of our different groups. I've worked in the CMS group and our infrastructure group. Now I think I've found my home in our materials group. Thanks, Tyler and, and Nate. Uh, I'm glad you're here. I want to start with you, Nate. When when did you uh, know that, you know, the career that you have, when did you know that civil engineering and where you are now was the thing you wanted to do? I started off in drafting class in high school, actually. Um, I had never done anything in the drafting world whatsoever. I hadn't really heard about construction or civil engineering whatsoever, but I loved my drafting teacher back in high school. Um, I took classes with him all four years. Um, up until my senior year of high school, I spent pretty much half of every day with him doing a whole lot of three-dimensional modeling in software programs, as well as a little bit of architectural drafting. Um, my first ever CAD work was done in high school. And I thought that I wanted to be an architect when I set off into uh, academia. And as I approached that and started talking to more and more professional architects, they were practicing told them my interests. I told them my strengths, my weaknesses. Um, and the more and more I talked to them, the more and more they said I sounded more like an engineer than an architect. <laughs> um, so I set forth trying to figure out what type of engineering was right for me. There's so many different types. It's so daunting. Met with a couple at some college fairs, a couple academic staff, and they had told me about civil engineering and the different subsets of that. Um, so I set forth uh, into, uh, I went to Wayne State, went for civil engineering. Uh, that did not change. I went through the entire four years of it with them. I uh, graduated with my bachelor's in civil engineering. Came here to SME at first, <laughs> right after college. Started working in the CMS department. Actually, I forgot to mention that. Uh, I started as a materials tester, field engineer here. Did that for about nine months or so, and then hopped over to the team that I'm currently on <laughs> uh, in structural materials. That was my first real dose of uh, hardcore practical structural engineering, and I fell in love. I've loved it ever since. Uh, I love the consulting side of things, and uh, I love building frames, concrete, steel, masonry, and wood. That's that's my life, and uh, it's great. I tell this story often whenever anyone asks me what got me into civil engineering. I still remember coming home when I was in middle school, and my sister was building a balsa wood bridge for one of her high school projects for her architecture class. When I saw it, there was just something amazing about the bridge and how how it functions. You know, the how you can carry the same loads that would normally be supported by the earth and then throw it hundreds of feet up in the air and it still carries the same loads. And just something about that balsa wood bridge just sparked my interest. And from that day on, I, I kind of knew I wanted to do something with bridges. And then as I got into high school, I did a lot of the same stuff that Nate did. I had drafting classes and architecture classes, and that's really where, you know, the love started to kind of develop for civil engineering. Never really thought about going into architecture, but I, I kind of knew, you know, the structural side was really where I wanted to be. I went on to Henry Ford, and I started my degree there, and then moved on to Wayne State. So now me and Nate are Wayne State students together. Go Warriors. Yeah. So so what are you pursuing now? I'm still pursuing my bachelor's. I've got about six months left. 
So I'm almost there. It's been a long road. I mean, I started in 2011 and now 2020. So it's been 11 years. I'll graduate after 12. It's been a hard journey, but being at SME, being here and getting to see the hands-on portion, there's a lot of times that I'm sitting in classes and just the experience that I have being in the field, it, I wouldn't trade it. it. It comes in handy, especially when you start doing structural analysis and reinforced concrete design. When you start getting in your structural classes and being able to see that stuff hands-on and just seeing the way that buildings, you know, perform, it, it really is priceless. A little backwards from the traditional path, right? A hundred percent. You've been in the field plenty from between all the different groups that you've been here. And I, you know, we work on projects together here in materials. So just, uh, you know, I know PhD students that have less practical field knowledge than, than you do. And, uh, you know, they really go hand in hand. So I'm, I'm sure that that's definitely a big help for you in your coursework. Oh, absolutely. Tyler, how did you end up at SME specifically? They say, they always say, it's not what you know, it's who you know. And my, uh, my mom, she was here on a temporary work assignment, um, covering for one of the accountants. So she was here when I was a sophomore in college. So I had spent a couple of years at Henry Ford and I was about to switch over to Wayne State and she heard about the co-op program. So I figured I'd come over and give it a try. And when I came over, I, I loved doing the concrete testing and the density testing. And then I, uh, I still remember I sat down with Kevin Barton and he was like, okay, so when are you, when are you leaving at the end of my co-op? And I was like, well, I'm married and I've got bills. So whenever you guys kick me out the door, I'll have to find a new job. <laughs> and, uh, they decided to bring me on and I've been working here ever since. So it's really, I, I got to give the credit to, uh, to the co-op program and bringing me in and my mom, definitely. So she was the one that gave me the application and said, fill this out. You need a job. That's so cool. I never even knew that about you. <laughs> That's really awesome. Um, so I had uh, three internships uh, throughout my college career, uh, all in the summers. The first two were with a construction management firm. Um, that was my first ever boots on the ground experience on a construction site. Both were pretty big uh, with a whole lot of different services going on at one point in time. So information overload as a 17, 18 year old, <laughs> um, for sure. Um, and construction management's cool, but I always saw myself doing more of the, you know, actual design and engineering side of things with my degree and with, you know, my particular skill set. Um, so my last internship was with a, a full service AE design firm. Started off as like a project management co-op, but that didn't really they didn't really have a ton of work for me. So I kind of wandered over down to the civil department and they were swamped. <laughs> so, uh, within a week they had me trained up on AutoCAD and civil 3d. And, uh, I had then began, you know, doing full civil design for, you know, site design and utility plans and grading plans and all that fun stuff. I wasn't really crazy about either one of those <laughs> services, um, for my internships. So, uh, it was more uh, learning what I did not want to do with the rest of my life, um, which is just as important as learning what you do, I think. So then I talked to Sherry as well. Um, the Around Christmas time of my senior year in college, um, SME offered me to join the CMS team as a tester. And I jumped at the bit. I had my, I, I said, absolutely. I signed my offer uh, before the first of the year and had a nice little last semester of uh, not really worrying about where I was going to start my career. Then I did the testing for a summer and a fall and right about uh, before the turn of the year of my first year working here, there was an opening in the structure of materials team. Uh, I knew that without having ever had structural experience before, I kind of had a feeling that that was where I was going to be gravitating towards. Um, it's not the easiest field to break into, or at least it wasn't in 2017. So I jumped at the bit, I interviewed, uh, they hired me on and I, uh, I began my time on this team as a staff engineer, really liked doing what I was doing um, while I was here. I did, um, I did leave SME uh, in March, 2020. We refer to that as your brief lapse in loyalty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I had to, uh, I had to go see uh, what color the grass was. 
And that was coincidentally at the same time the pandemic began. So a really wacky period for me. Um, But I stayed over there for two years doing um, full service structural design. So uh, pretty much all working from home as well. So I had just bought a house and was sitting in my third bedroom of my house for about two years (laughs) doing a whole bunch of uh, Revit and structural design for them. Uh, for another, yeah, full turnkey uh, firm, uh, Big A, Little E. Um, And then uh, earlier this year, I got a call back from the lovely people here at SME. They wanted to go out to dinner. And uh, a month later, I (laughs) had come right on back to the uh, exact same team that I left. Um, It's been a great, great, great decision. Um, The consulting world, I think, is definitely more for me than the uh, full service design side of things, especially in the structural engineering aspect. We just have so many unique projects and such great scopes here. I like being able to have my finger in a whole bunch of different pies and wear a whole bunch of different hats. And uh, yeah, I'm loving every minute of it. Best decision ever. I, I do have to say that I have to kind of credit Nate as well with me jumping over to the materials group because when he left after a couple months of him being gone, That's when they were looking for some new people and putting out feelers. And that's when I got kind of introduced into the mix. So maybe if he didn't leave, I wouldn't be over. So there you go. It's not all bad. (laughs) (laughs) Well, no, not at all. Uh, um, As a, you know, as a guy who's worked a couple different places myself, I I think that it does kind of give you perspective on, on, you know, knowing a good thing when you see it and, and really you know, understanding the benefits of one place and the differences between one and the other. So talking about those differences, you know, SME is a consulting firm. And as such, our work is different. From your perspective, uh, Nate, particularly because you, you had that full service design experience, what are the attractions for you to consulting over traditional design? The variety in projects, I think, is really what the stepping stone for me to come back um, at a full service firm Typically, especially if you're doing a lot of bigger new construction, large fee jobs, um, you'll be working on the same or a very select few amount of jobs for an extended amount of time. Some people really like that. They like to go through the entire process of this was just an infant thought and now it is this $100 million building that they completely designed from you know scratch. Um, and I think there is some merit to that. But uh, the types of projects that we do here are a lot smaller fee, a lot smaller scope. We're kind of in, uh, we do our specific assessment or specific repair of an element as opposed to an entirety of a uh, building um, or maybe a specific group of bridges or something. I've been doing a lot more bridge work over here. And um, that's so much more interesting to me, (laughs) Um, being able to not know what's coming down the pipe in a week, a month, a year from now. I love that. (laughs) Not every, that's not for everybody, but I really like the variety. I get up out of bed every morning, not really knowing exactly what I'm going to be totally doing uh, that that day or that week. And it keeps me on my toes. It keeps things very fresh. And you're always learning more and more about different systems, different buildings, different materials by doing that. Yeah, I, just, I like going all over the place. We do a ton of work in, in Michigan, a lot in Southeast Michigan. I've been a Southeast Michigan man my whole life. Um, and being able to go out and, and put my hands on a building and, you know, having the, the field experience as well as the, you know, come back in the office and do the design of it, something that you just looked at, um, I think is more fun. <laughs> uh, I get a lot more enjoyment out of that aspect of things. You know, I'm uh, kind of getting into project management more here, um, something that would not have been within my grasp within the next 10, 15 years, <laughs> possibly at a, at a much larger firm like that. Um, I love that portion of it too. I think of myself as a pretty decent project manager, being able to have those soft skills and abilities to manage projects. um, That gets me really excited. Um, I like the accounting aspect of it. I like the proposals, the sales, you know, it's, it's, you're a jack of all trades. You have to be, to be able to be a really successful consultant. And um, that's what gets me out of bed in the morning. I think that's a lot of the similarities between our whole team and our whole group is you, you really don't know what you're going to be doing day to day. And you have kind of the projects that you're working on, but in one day you could get a call from a client saying, Hey, we've got this emergency. We need you to come out here. And then you spend your next couple of days doing that. 
you know, we, we got a call a couple of weeks ago about an anchor rod that, you know, it had been damaged and they needed it tested. And so I immediately stopped what I was doing. We jumped on that. And in a couple of days we were out there testing it. And then immediately we're right back in the swing of things and dealing with masonry approach ways and uh, dealing with bridges. And we're, we're kind of all over the place and it, it's, it's really quite, I can't think of a better word, but it's quite beautiful being able to explore every, every part of what we what we learned in school and what really interested us. I mean, you are dealing with different materials and you're, we're doing masonry design. We do a little bit with pre-stressed. You've got concrete and steel and we really look at all of it. And while we're not designing whole buildings and that, those little intricate elements and the elements that are corroding that usually we're, we're assessing, those are the ones that are, are quite fun. It's really where you take your homework problems from school and you slap some real life pictures to it. You know, you actually get to go out and touch and feel how the, how the, everything is interacting. And that's, that's the fun part. So in your case, Tyler, we, uh, we recently, uh, uh, decided to uh, branch out into mixed design consulting. Can you talk a little bit about that? This was something that if you asked me a couple of years ago, it, it would be interesting to me, but I guess it kind of started when I was in CMS. I, I constantly have a grasp or uh, I want to constantly obtain more knowledge, you know, and one of the things that was pretty interesting to me was concrete testing. So there was a level two offered by a level two MCA cert that was offered and I wanted to keep getting it or I kept asking to get that certification. And once I finally got it, it got into mixed design stuff. So since I had that knowledge, I never really fully got the use out of it that I was hoping to get out of it. So when I was trying to come up with my little path to go down. I was talking with Hyder and he was, he was saying, if you've done mixed design stuff and you're certified to do it, have you looked into doing it anymore? Or, and he brought up, uh, one of the guys that used to work here and how he used to analyze different mixtures for the gradations. And he would work with different contractors and, and companies to come up with an optimized mixture for different applications and whether it's being pumped or whether it's being placed in a mass concrete or whether it's going to be a floor slab. I mean, all those affect the different aggregate gradations that you put into your mix. So I decided then that that was something that had always been interesting to me, but never, but it just kept getting pushed on the back burner. And that kind of brought it to the brought it to the front and it just turns into a big puzzle. I mean, every, every time you see some sort of deterioration or corrosion, there's a big puzzle on what, what caused it, but also, you know, what could they have done differently to avoid it? So, and a lot of that is, you know, we're trying to focus on both sides, you know, with concrete technology, we're trying to help producers and contractors on the front side. So that way they don't have these where they don't have shrinkage problems and they don't have ASR damage. And there's not, there's not those problems in the future that it, it'd be nice because we assess them in the, in the future. So we could revisit it, but I'd rather it be avoided and not assessed in the future. So that's, that's kind of what got, got us started with it. And I still have a lot of growing to do, but I feel like that's kind of anybody who the first, 20 years of their career, they're still learning an awful lot. I got news for you. It's, it's not just your first 20 years. I think if you do this career, right, if you do consulting, right, you're always learning, you're learning something new every day. And in, in fact, for me as you know, the old gray haired guy in this room, it, that's part of my, it's appeal to me is that I like, you know, I, I have a short attention span and so sure I can help you out with something that I've already, already done before and I have lots of experience and I'm, I'm glad that that's valued. But I also like learning about new things, and and I think that that's part of the appeal for me, as a consultant, is that you are always learning, you're always uh, advancing your expertise, 
because it's just part of the job. Oh yeah. If you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. Yeah. I, I, I hate to say it. I, I don't think I am the smartest person. If I was the smartest person in the room, I'd be a brain surgeon. But, you know, uh, that would not be me. So Nate, uh, have you got any favorite projects since uh, you've been here? There's been so, so, so many, like, honestly, I don't even know if I could count them all. Um, Do you need to help with the definition of the word favorite? <laughs> well, for those of us that um, aren't familiar with what a swing stage is, think of like a skyscraper and window washers coming down the side of it, and they just continuously go up and down on this little platform. Um, that platform is called a swing stage, and it is attached to the very top of the building by counterweights and basically ropes in a pulley system that are only attached to those counterweights from said top of building, causing it to literally swing away from, <laughs> away from the building. Uh, quite terrifying, but I will always remember the first time that I was ever on one. It was on a quite large building in a downtown area. Um, and I was, had to have been up at least 400 feet in the air on this thing on a more particularly windy day than I would have liked. <laughs> um, we were doing a facade assessment um, now we can do a lot of that with uh, some drone capabilities. So there's a little bit less of us, <laughs> uh, you know, daredeviling it up there. Um, but that one was awesome because that definitely got rid of my uh, fear of heights. <laughs> um, turns out as a structural engineer, especially in a more urban environment, uh, you're going to be up pretty high more than, <laughs> than you might have originally have thought. Um, so I always think of that as, as a, a really fun one just because... I've been on, I've been up twice as tall as that since. And, uh, my fear of heights has definitely gone away quite, quite a bit. <laughs> Another one, I would say, uh, this one in particular that I'm thinking of was during my first stint here. And we basically brought in upwards of a thousand concrete blocks. Um, and we picked one bay of this building and we wanted to make sure that it could withstand, uh, a change of occupancy loading. Um, so in, once you change the occupancy of a building, there's a whole bunch of codes that get engaged and a whole bunch of rehabilitation, maintenance, coding, and standards um, that you have to abide by. Um, and if you can't prove it mathematically, then you have to go out there and actually do it physically. So we set up all these gauges on the bottom side of a floor. We shored uh, this, this second story supported floor all the way down to the ground. And we had these deflection gauges and all these wires hooked up to all of them. We had contractors then go ahead and lay out in a uniform manner these blocks and up to four layers tall. <laughs> and we measured how much the reinforced concrete slab actually moved downward under those said deflections. And if it didn't move too much, then uh, basically it passed and it allowed for the change of occupancy loading. Um, I had never been a part of anything like that, didn't know that that even existed. Uh, that was definitely one of the more cool things that, I mean, just so many different unique stories like that on jobs. Um, but those, those two kind of stand out to me for sure as like outside person looking in the box, like, what do you do for a living? <laughs> you go ahead and tell them that kind of a story and they're like, wow, I <laughs> didn't know that existed. Didn't know that ever took place. Didn't know anything about that. So those are a couple of my favorites. So Tyler, I think I already know the answer to this question, uh, as far as you're concerned, but, uh, What's your favorite project right now? I'm working currently on a very large bridge. We've been out there for years and working on rehabilitating the deck and the members. There's a lot of different types of inspections that I've that I've picked up on uh, different NDT. Really, it w it would be it would be an amazing project just to work on if all I got to do was just stand there, but. <laughs> actually getting to deal with the intricacies of the design and we're not doing the design, but we're working directly with the engineer record and making sure everything's being built per plan. And you, you start to really take a sense of ownership. You know, you feel like you actually are part of the reason that bridge is still standing. I mean, I, we talked about it before why I got into civil engineering to start off with and, I always hoped that one day I'd be able to drive by a single bridge that I worked on and had a big part in and be able to look in the back seat and tell my daughters that, hey, I helped work, I helped build that. 
and I might not be the one that's installing or placing concrete or, you know, installing bolts, but I feel like with the amount of work that we've done out there, it, we, we play a pretty intricate role, you know, with the inspection and it has to definitely be my, my favorite project. So, and we're, we're not done yet. So there's still a lot of, a lot of work to go. Another big project that I worked on that was when every time I bring it up to my wife, she just kind of, just kind of laughs it off. Like, oh, it's not that big of a deal, but we basically dug a giant hole in the ground and filled it back in with sand. It was a remediation project. So we were removing hazardous waste and, uh, we dug a 30 foot hole in the ground and we filled it back in one foot at a time with sand. And it sounds so boring and monotonous, but it, uh, it was, I, I felt like it was a very fun project. I spent a year and a half. I had to take a, a nuclear density test every 50 foot by 50 foot where there was a whole grid laid out and I, I had to have one test. I think by the time I was done in that year and a half, we took 1300 recordable density tests and uh i have to say that was it was fun for the opposite reason of every day i woke up i knew exactly what i'd be doing it was uh you do kind of help troubleshoot some of that stuff i mean i'm not going to take anything away from the material testing that we do here you you do try and troubleshoot moisture moisture um, concerns and you know if the moisture is too dry they're not going to get it there was other times that I remember it was when we had a really cold winter and they were bringing in 120 gravel trains of sand every day and the one day they stopped after 20 loads because I looked at the foreman and I said that sand is literally froze in the truck it's froze in the truck if you lift up the truck it'll just tip over because the sand's not coming out and so they, they stopped trucking that day. It was that cold, but that was a, it was a pretty fun project. It was also, I got to use my, my Haswhopper cert and I quite enjoy that one because you're, it's another puzzle. I don't know. I guess everything that I'm interested in, I, I look at as puzzles, but out there, there was a bunch of different hazards and you're constantly monitoring and remediating and using air mist to keep all the particulates down and it, it was a it was a very interesting process so we don't we don't often do many large-scale remediation projects here so that was kind of a that was kind of a fun one i mean i know environmental does some more with that stuff but i haven't done anything as big as that one so it was quite fun so let's let's presume that you know one of the six people listening out there is really interested. They're a college student in civil engineering, and they're you know they're you really pique their interest. What would you recommend that they do? Well, keep going to class. <laughs> 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 uh, I know it starts to get pretty tough there at the end, but <laughs> no. Um, there's so many different routes that you can go down in this industry. Um, from my experience, you know, just being in the construction management world, uh, full service design, or here in consulting, are just three off the top of my head. Um, different directions you can go just with the civil engineering type degree. SME in itself really exemplifies like that umbrella that I was talking about earlier because it is just one giant civil engineering company. We have geotechnical engineers. We have environmental engineers. We have transportation infrastructure engineers. We have structural engineers. Uh, we have building and closure specialists, um, you know, even architects. It, it's amazing how many different avenues you can travel down you need to find out what you like to do the most. You have to figure out what gets you the most excited. And if you are in a position like that as an entry level person, and it's something that you are not extremely passionate about, then I implore you to find something that you are more passionate about because it is out there. You are going to find something that really tickles your fancy. And it's okay if you're not in love with the first one, two, three, five things you adventure down. There's just so much out there for you to explore and learn and talk to people, talk to people that do it every single day, talk to professionals because they're going to tell you exact, you know, they're not going to tell you what you want to hear. They're going to tell you exactly how it is. Listen more, speak less, 
and uh, you'll find what's right for you. And I think I think everybody everybody should do that, not just college students. I think that's that's good advice for everybody. I wanted to butt in a couple of times and say something, but every time I would go to say something, Nate would take the words right out of my mouth. I mean, it starting off in in the CMS group, you get exposed to a lot of different stuff. You're doing your concrete testing, density testing, foundations, but when you do foundations, when you do proof rolls, you're exposed to geotechnical reports. You can see the work that our geotechnical department is doing. When it comes to, you know, starting off your your engineering career, working at SME is really a great opportunity because you get exposed to all those different types of groups. You know, there's not very many civil engineering firms out there that they have, you know, world-class environmental engineers and geotechnical engineers and structural engineers and architects. And there's a great group of people here that my big recommendation to any young striving civil engineer or any engineer that has already graduated, really get in and do a co-op, do internships, do that stuff where you may think that you're interested in doing transportation engineering and, and realize if you do an internship with a transportation engineering company that maybe that's not really what you want to do. You know, maybe you have more of a passion for the geotechnical side and helping design subgrades and an aggregate basis for roadways. Or maybe you are working for a geotechnical firm and as a an intern or a co-op and maybe you decide that the structural part, maybe you struggled in school with the math part of it, but maybe maybe you're just suited to do it practically. There is a lot of things that while school builds the base, it's not the end all be all. There is a difference there between practicality. And I think sometimes there's students that struggle with the equations and that that come along with transportation engineering or geotechnical or your hydraulics. And sometimes they're pushed away from certain different groups and paths that really getting out there and in a job that that you think might suit you, that can really help guide you. So don't really ever plant your feet and say, this is where, this is my first job out of, out of school, or this is where I'm going to be. You know, as much as I'd like every, every person that comes in the door at SME to say, I'm going to stay right, right here and do testing and that the rest of my life. I, I think there's a lot of other groups. I mean, that's kind of what I ended up doing with going from CMS to infrastructure to materials, I, I just kept exploring and I really found what I enjoy doing now. Kind of gotten to the end of, end of the show here. Is there any, any final thoughts? I, to anyone who's listening to this, I, I really hope that if they're just getting into civil engineering or even if they've been doing it a while, really take a look and look into yourself and figure out why you're still passionate about what you're doing or what, what drives you. I, I think that's very, very important. I think a lot of times nowadays, everybody's so money focused. The money will come. If you're doing something that you genuinely enjoy doing, you're going to get very good at it. And if you get very good at whatever you're doing, the money will come. Too often, people are strictly focused on money. And you may not be getting paid, you know, the dollar more or $2 more, you know, doing what you're doing, but in the long run, it all equals out. I mean, with the stuff that I'm doing and I'm truly passionate about, you start working your way up in companies. I haven't graduated yet. And SME has, they've always taken care of me and they've always promoted me and kept me forward, forward driven. So I'm always, I always feel like I'm climbing up. So, and I think that's very important. I think we went through this whole podcast and none of us really talked about the driving factor and what we're doing is making, making money. I think there's really no question that money is, is, is not really, I mean, if, if you're going to be in this, you know, if, if you're in, in your career to make money, then being, you know, in this career is probably the wrong career. I mean, be an investment banker, be a lawyer, be a, you know, 
be one of the higher paid professions. But I think for most people, it's not usually about making money. Everybody's got another reason why they do things. I believe strongly that I'm in this business to help people. I help people solve problems that they cannot solve on their own. And I, and I think that it's, uh, that's what gets me up in the morning. So I, I do believe you're right. I've been on, I can't count how many sites, but I've been on, you know, over a hundred different sites that I, I'd, I'd bet money on that figure, but, um, <laughs> where I've said something and their client has looked at a, at me and been like, wow, thank you. I didn't think about that or, huh, interesting, you know, and they, they truly appreciate the value that we're providing. I, it, it's nice getting to meet with our clients and provide them deliverables and really help them in a time where they need help. I mean, the assessments and that, that we do the evaluations, a lot of times that doesn't come because they want to do it. It comes because they're in a pinch and you know, they want to know if they can like when a, when a building developer buys a building and doesn't know if they can change the occupancy, they probably didn't think about that initially, but that that's something that we are really able to provide a value there. And there's a genuine appreciation for that. And I think that's what kind of drives a lot of us. I, I may really like bridges and, and doing that, but it's nice working on bridges and seeing an appreciation for that and really helping our clients out. I think it goes back to what you were saying, Eric, really helping, helping people. That's really what it comes down to. Yeah, I'll echo that as well and tie that into, you know, why I like love consulting so much. I think that I have um, the biggest reach and a range of different clientele um, and people that I'll interface on a given week or month. Exactly. I'm just echoing everything Tyler said, that the ability to help people with my my given skill set to help, you know, revitalize what we have going on here. Um, you know, we're pretty metro to Detroit here. Obviously, when we went to school there, it's not been the greatest city over the course of the last half century. Um, but you see the renaissance that is happening um, and being able to be a part of that in such a wide urban area that I've, you know, been living in and, and down, you know, down and around uh, plenty uh, over the course of the second half of my life is huge. It's awesome. Um, I love buildings. I love big buildings. Uh, I love seeing new developments go up. I love working on projects down there uh, for these types of developers that are finding these abandoned, bombed out uh, structures. And then you turn around in a couple of years and they are these, you know, flourishing retail centers or multifamily living residential uh, structures that, you know, it's crazy to see and uh, is just really actually what you're doing, what the end scheme of, of everything that you're trying to do here in this industry, everybody's working together. The teamwork aspect of it, especially in the consulting world is massive. The friendships and the networking that I've created, uh, even just in my short lived career so far are going to last me for a lifetime. And, uh, it's, it's really great. Cool. All right. I want to thank you gentlemen for joining me today. This has been the, uh, Building Revitalized podcast. I'm your host, Eric Morell, and I want to say thank you to Tyler Gendron and uh, Nate Sexton. Uh, gentlemen, I wish you a lot of luck in your uh, future career, and uh, thank you for joining us. Thanks so much, Eric. Yes, thanks, Eric. Thank you for listening to the Build and Revitalize podcast series featuring the SME Building Materials Group. And thanks to Nate and Tyler for joining us, both on this podcast and on the Building Materials Structural Team. Our last episode is not one to miss. We are joined by a landscape architect turned roofing consultant, Lloyd Dubisky, and SME's own architect, daredevil, and masonry expert, Amanda Cassidy. Like what you're hearing? Don't forget to subscribe to the Build and Revitalize podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. And don't forget to visit www.sme-usa.com backslash podcast to join the conversation, access the show notes, and catch up on our previous episodes. While you're at it, connect with SME USA on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube.